countdown. Okay. Okay, hi everyone. Welcome to Historian Splaining. A historian tells you why everything you know is wrong. And I'm here live with my producer Dan, who has been behind the scenes on all of these videos thus far, but we get to see his beautiful face for a, at least a minute tonight <laughs> while we get introduced. So this will be the third video lecture that we've made. And it's the third installment on a survey of Western architecture. And this one will be on the Renaissance and Baroque eras. So a very important transitional moment in the history of architecture. Uh, but if you haven't seen the first two, you, you can see them on my channel. And I'll refer back to them a bit. But even if you haven't seen them, I'm sure you'll enjoy and learn a lot here tonight. So uh, people can put in questions in the chat. And Dan will helpfully uh, select out those questions that we might be able to respond to, comment on as we go through the lecture tonight. Yeah, I'll, I'll start the ones um, that, uh, that are questions so you can take a look. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, but all feedback is welcome. All, pro all creators love getting feedback, whatever it is. So thanks for everyone uh, for, for joining live. If you're here live tonight or if you're watching later. But I will start in on the slides and pick up where we left off uh, the story with the early Renaissance. And then before I finish a section, I'll look, I'll check the chat and see, see what's going on, what people are thinking. And sign up on Patreon. Yes, and please sign up to support on Patreon. It's enormously appreciated. It's what's made it possible for me to keep making all these different lectures through the past several years. Uh, so... It, it really means a lot. Or tell friends and family, friends, enemies, frenemies, all of the above. All right. I'll see you later. Good luck. Great. Thanks, Dan. Okay. So you all are seeing hopefully my first slide here. This is a little scene, which I'll talk about later, from the interior of St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, which was a critical not only a monumental work, but a transitional work between the Renaissance and Baroque eras. So it's sort of right in the middle of the story I'm gonna to try to tell tonight. And I left off previously talking about um, the early Renaissance. And as I've gone through these lectures, I've tried to always refer back to certain basic core concepts, the basic axes of variation that I like to use to describe the different styles of architecture as they've evolved through the centuries. So just to quickly recap, verticalism versus horizontalism. Do the lines of your building emphasize height and do they point upward to the heavens, emphasizing how the building towers over the landscape? Or horizontalism, do they reach outward and emphasize how the building embraces the landscape around it? Linearity versus centrality. Is your building oriented to lead the visitor on a central linear axis from front to back, like say a traditional basilica, or do they emphasize centrality and do they focus inward, looking inward towards a central focal point? And finally, plainness and simplicity versus richness and ornamentation, uh, which is pretty self-explanatory. So you may remember last time when I talked about the Middle Ages, I put forward an argument or a theory that styles of architecture tend to go through a cycle, which one could liken to the seasons of a year. And that very often when a new style develops, it starts off from a place of simplicity, understatement, and then gradually in stages becomes more ornate, more embellished, more complex until it reaches a kind of tipping point where it can't go any further. And then eventually there's a reaction and a return back to simplicity and understatement. So I argued you can see a cycle like that happening from the Carolingian age through the Romanesque and the Gothic, and then eventually to 
the early Renaissance, which I characterize as a winter type style, emphasizing simplicity, balance, and understatement. Whereas uh, the Romanesque I described as a spring style. Well, now that we've gotten to the Renaissance, I would again say the early Renaissance is a sort of winter style. The spring in this case is the high Renaissance which experimented with bolder classical forms, the revival, especially of Roman style embellishment and ornamentation, and also really strove after central designs rather than linear. And then the summer is the late Renaissance, basically the mid and late 1500s, which experiments with inventive embellishment and distortion, breaking the sort of straight lines and symmetries that people were used to from the earlier Renaissance, and then an autumn period in the Baroque, which is the height really of complexity, drama, extreme embellishment, uh, and emphasis on motion, action, and clashing forces. Until eventually in the mid 1700s, there was a reaction back to the sort of classicism that you saw in the early Renaissance, really, a return towards simplicity balance, but this time with a new attention to the environment and to romantic evocative settings. And I'll explain how that happened primarily most of all in England at the end of the lecture. So to begin where we left off, uh, I left off talking about Brunelleschi's design for the dome of the Duomo in Florence, which is still today really the great symbol of Florence and of the early Renaissance, this creation of a simple, symmetrical, domed structure such as had not been created anywhere in the West since the Roman age, uh, unless one counts you know, Santa Sophia and the great Byzantine monuments in Constantinople. But this kind of announced the new ambition to create monuments that evoked a sense of restraint, uh, reflectiveness, even serenity that people associated with these surviving Roman monuments that they saw around them, especially in Italy. And really, the, the Dome of the Duomo is so famous and so monumental, partly because it's an exception. It's a grand, uh, enormous, towering early Renaissance masterpiece. Most early Renaissance buildings that tried to capture this sort of new sense of classical balance and harmony tended to be smaller. And Brunelleschi went on to have a long career as the sort of first genius celebrity architect of the early Renaissance. And he mostly designed smaller buildings, more intimate. And right on the heels of building the Dome of the Duomo, he oversaw the complete rebuilding of the Basilica of San Lorenzo, also in Florence, which was a dramatic break from what people were used to in the Gothic. If you think back to those images we saw of late Gothic buildings with their heavy ornamentation, their crowding with statuary and fine carvings and high vaulted ceilings and tracery. Well, San Lorenzo was a statement of something very different that in some ways really evoked the, the late Roman era, right? And the basilicas of more than a thousand years earlier. So you have this very simple, open, symmetrical, colonnaded interior space. The side aisles have been lifted up. The columns are set apart with these wide sweeping half circle arches. You can easily see all around you, again, like in an ancient Roman basilica, and the ornamentation is understated, right? There are these classical references like the Corinthian pillar capitals, but they're simple, they're, and they're rendered in just this soft bluish gray color, almost a sort, of, a sort of light slate gray, almost like it's just the raw stone coming right out of the ground. And, but, and around it is just this simple whitewashed plaster that reflects the light. It looks airy, open, simple, uh, contemplative, right? And this became the new look of the early Renaissance church. And it made a dramatic contrast, right, with this sort of uh, overwrought Gothic model. He also, beyond that, his real masterpieces were even smaller, 
right? And, and this sort of intimate, serene feel of an early Renaissance church or chapel was captured in very simple, plain, understated structures. And one of Brunelleschi's most important was this new chapel at Santa Croce in Florence paid for by the Pazzi family, one of these sort of uh, you know rich magnate oligarch families of Florence. And they paid to have this chapel added on to the outside of Santa Croce, which is a common practice, right? When a new radical style comes up, patrons will play, pay for small additions to be kind of glommed on to existing buildings that show off the new style, the new taste. And what was so dramatic about the Pazzi Chapel, for one thing, this is the ground plan as designed by Brunelleschi. And you can see it's dramatically central, right? There is an entrance portico, but then once you're inside, the, the actual altar uh, chancel is so small and it's sunken back into this back wall, it's almost invisible. And the emphasis is all looking inward towards this little open space under a dome, this little rotunda in the middle. So you're losing this sort of familiar linear forward thrust of a church. And it's looking more and more like the way a Renaissance scholar or designer would imagine an ancient Roman temple. And this is the front facade with a porch added on that wasn't always there. But nonetheless, you can see the shape, the outline of this front facade mimics a Roman triumphal arch, right? It's basically like this, the shape of the Arch of Titus or the Arch of Constantine shrunken down to a kind of miniature size and with even less ornamentation than you would see on an actual Roman triumphal arch, even more plain, understated, monochrome. This is what it looks like inside, right? So this airy, open, simple space, probably acoustically very clear and strong. And as I said, the chancel here almost disappears. You can, you can barely see the altar, right? It sort of disappears into this back niche, not even really a chancel anymore. And instead the emphasis is on this simple rectangular inner space these very simple, uh, understated, engaged pillars, the dome almost unornamented, practically austere. And then this is a closer up look at the ornamental frieze. So you see the frieze running along the top of the chamber here. And the ornamentation was put in by Luca della Robbia, who was a famous ceramics sculptor. And if you look closely, you see there is a Christian theme, but it's very veiled and understated. It's a lamb representing Christ and then some angels. If you didn't look closely and know how to interpret them, you could almost miss that this was even a Christian building, right? It's being so toned down. It's looking more and more like a sort of plain, maybe a plain side chamber in a Roman villa or temple. So Brunelleschi's ideas had a tremendous impact. He died in the 1440s, so not long after, but his ideas were carried on and extended by other sort of genius Renaissance man architects, most of all Leon Battista Alberti, who was born in Le Marche in the northeastern part of Italy, but went to Florence, studied, became a kind of friendly rival of Brunelleschi, and took his same basic ideas and blew them up to a somewhat grander scale. And one of his really important works was this Basilica di Sant'Andrea in Mantova. So Alberti also became really the first architect to start to take this new Florentine style and move it out to other cities, especially farther north, to the north and northeast in Italy. And it became more and more an Italian-wide movement, not just Florentine. And this was his first sort of grand monument in Mantova. And you can see the facade. Again, it's very simple and understated, although it's a little bit more embellished. There is a little bit more activity to it than the Pazzi Chapel. But again, the outline is based on a Roman triumphal arch. In this case, specifically the Arch of Trajan, which still stands in Ancona in northeastern Italy, not far from where Alberti was from. And you can see one of the crucial elements he carried over here is what's called the uh, giant 
register or giant uh, order, which is these stretched engaged pillars that go all the way from the ground up to the cornice at the top of the facade. And this creates a sense of sort of understated grandeur and also of unity, that the different layers and stories of this facade are being tied together by these sweeping vertical lines. But then it's capped off, of course, by this Greek style uh, to entablature, little peaked entablature, like you'd see on a Greek temple. So he's sort of freely mixing and matching these elements to create something that looks unified, harmonious, and that balances the vertical and horizontal elements. And he also took part in the reinvention of the palazzo. So in the late Middle Ages, magnate families and even rulers would have palaces, but they were like little fortresses. And they would have high uh, sheer walls with small windows, and they would have towers and turrets. Right? They even even if they weren't really fortresses in function, they were made to look like that. Well, in the late 1400s, certain cities in Italy became stable and secure enough that the magnate families didn't need little fortresses like that anymore. They could build in a new style with lots of windows, with big, wide, sweeping facades facing out to the street or to the countryside if they're out in the countryside. And that could use sort of these gentle, uh, harmonic, rhythmic, Roman-style colonnades and arcades. And this was probably the first grand Renaissance palazzo built in Urbino for the Duke of Urbino in the 1450s. And various different architects and builders worked on it. We don't know who all of them were. But you can see it's facing inwards towards a courtyard. It has a central focus. So it, it's, again, experimenting with more central designs. And it has these sort of set back and tapering upper floors to look more light, less imposing. And then Alberti got in on the game as well. And in Florence, he designed the Palazzo Rucellai, which actually became really the model and prototype for almost all Renaissance palazzi from then onwards. And you can see it has these three stories separated by this sort of gentle, uh, barely projecting cornice. And then each story is decorated a little bit differently, right? Here you have plain, a plain flat architrave on these engaged, simple Doric pillars. And then you get Ionic pillars and then Corinthian pillars on the top floor. So it's getting a little bit more embellished, a little bit more ornate as you go from the ground floor, which looks more plain and functional, up to the upper floors. And Within the Palazzo Ducale in Urbino, which we just looked at, there also are very rich, complex, and in some places, fantastical frescoes. And fresco painting was flourishing all through the Renaissance, and more and more, it became integrated into the very idea and look of a Renaissance building. And a lot of the themes and subjects of Renaissance frescoes were buildings. And this is a really crucial example here in the Palazzo Ducale. This is the so-called ideal city fresco, which is by an unknown artist. It might have been uh, Fra Angelico, but it's it's actually unknown. Or no, not Fra Angelico. I can't remember exactly. But it's been attributed to different artists, but ultimately we don't know who painted it. But you can see in this imaginary city, there are these sort of perfectly balanced, harmonious Again, three-story high palazzi, just like the Palazzo Ducale or the Palazzo Rucellai. And then in the middle, dominating the scene, is this very simple and mysterious circular building, right? And this open doorway into this building is the focal point and actually literally the vanishing point, the perspective vanishing point of the painting. So everything sort of points inward towards this central round building. And it shows how more and more Renaissance designers and artists increasingly embraced this idea of the circle as the perfect form and of the circular or octagonal central focused building as sort of the perfect building, tying the environment or even the whole world around it together into one center. And another great example here is Pietro Perugino's 
fresco for the Sistine Chapel in the Vatican, which shows uh, Christ delivering the keys to St. Peter. So it's a biblical scene where Christ is giving authority to Peter, saying, I'm giving you the keys to heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you unloose on earth is loosed in heaven. So it's establishing the legitimacy of the papacy, right, of the pope as the ultimate uh, spiritual authority as the successor of St. Peter. But the scene is taking place in Jerusalem. And these Renaissance painters in the 1400s had no idea what Jerusalem really looked like. They had no exposure to it. And if they did, they weren't interested. Instead, they imagined a perfect Jerusalem. They, they imagined what they thought it should look like. So you see here in the background, these two Roman style triumphal arches, right? completely imaginary, and they're flanking a representation of Solomon's temple. And this became the common custom was to imagine Solomon's temple as the perfect building, the most sacred building, the center of the earth. And hence, it must be round. It must have a central plan, even though, according to the Bible, the Talmud, other sources, it was not. It had a linear plan from porch to hall to holy of holies. But Renaissance artists imagined it as being round. And you can see in this version, it had it's an octagon, and it has these four porches facing outward in the four directions. And this becomes a theme all through the Renaissance and the Baroque era, that uh, perfect forms, perfect shapes unite the four cardinal directions, north, west, east, and south, and pull them together into a central po focal point. And you can see in by the 1440s, by the time Bunaleski died, it was becoming more and more the trend for Renaissance architects to try to experiment with central forms and round forms. But it was very hard for them to execute any of these plans or ideas because that's not what many of the patrons wanted. So you could say this is sort of the beginning of this classic rift between patron and designer, right? patron and architect. The architects had adopted these principles that roundness represents perfection. And Brunelleschi managed by the end of his life to get one building started, which was a chapel added on to Santa Maria degli Angeli in Florence. But it was only the foundation was laid and a little bit of the building was built before he died. And it actually ended up just derelict and disused for hundreds of years until later it was completed. But you can see here, this is an overhead view of the, the chapel sort of tucked into the city around it that gives you a little sense of basically what Brunelleschi wanted it to look like. And then this became sort of the rage, right, in the later 1400s was imagining and proposing not only round buildings, but sometimes even whole imaginary cities based on round forms. So this is another architect named Filarete who drew up whole plans for an imaginary city that he called Zagalia. And the city itself would be this sort of star shape, really like a, like a fortress, actually. This is what earthwork fortresses at that time looked like. And then there would be clusters of buildings right at the center, and they would be on central plans as well. So it's sort of central plans concatenating on top of one another. And this was his design for the supposed church of this imaginary city. And you can see this does not look anything like any real life church. It's completely imaginary. And it seems as if he was inspired by the shape of the labyrinth in the Cathedral of Rheims in France, which also is patterned on, in turn, on a fortress. So we looked at this last time when we talked about the Middle Ages. But these are the sort of things people were imagining, experimenting with, and repeatedly trying and usually failing to actually get built. Now, one example that did actually get built was a late work, again, by Alberti, the Basilica of San Sebastiano in Mantova. And you can see with this basilica, he imagined again this sort of simple, understated, classical shaped uh, facade with this sort of weird alternating pattern of entranceways. Again, something very odd and unusual. And the plan of the church is central 
it is r roughly a cross shape. It's cruciform, so you could say it's church-like in that way. But it's a Greek cross, and moreover, he even pushed the corners out and created this sort of central square with sides of exactly equal length, such that, again, if you stand in the middle of it, you can't even really tell which way you're supposed to look. Uh, we'll see what it looks like inside in a moment. But remarkably, the cardinal who was paying for this new basilica to be built in Mantova was very confused and dismayed. And he's recorded as saying in one letter, I can't see if this is going to turn out a church or a mosque or a synagogue. And, you know, classic sort of humorous, exasperated remark. But he may have also been onto something, as we'll talk about later, in, in the sense that certain designers, whether they were completely open about it or not, certain Renaissance and Baroque architects did actually look to Jewish synagogues as a source of inspiration because they were oriented differently and they had more central plans. So it does seem that that was in some people's minds when they were designing these really radically new and different church forms. So this building was just finished. The fabric was just finished before Alberti died in, I believe, 1475. Uh, but the embellishment was not done before he died. So he probably intended for the interior to be covered with plaster and maybe given some very understated, simple, classical style decoration, like we saw in the Pazzi Chapel. But what happened is that this was never done. And the patrons, when they saw how the building looked with just the minimal basic adornment on the walls, they liked it that way and they kept it that way. So this is what it looks like. Almost shockingly austere, simple, really temple-like, or even you could say cave-like. And you couldn't even tell that it's a church, except for the fact that set back in this wall, this alcove, which is technically the chancel, there's this little altarpiece, probably inspired, I would think, by the Arapacus, a Roman altar from the age of Augustus that's still standing in Rome. And then on the back, <laughs> within this altarpiece, there is a crucifix. But other than that, you couldn't even tell this is a church. And if you're standing and looking in from one side, the different alcoves are identical. You wouldn't even be able to tell which way is the front or the back or which way you're supposed to be facing. Again, except for the fact that there is this classical altarpiece here. And if you're there at the right moment, you'd be hearing mass going on there. But you could say that this basilica in Mantova is sort of the, the spirit of the early Renaissance pushed all the way to its ultimate extreme, right? A church that at this point, barely even looks church-like. That is so simple, so understated. It almost looks like uh, a Roman ruin that has been spoliated or stripped bare, leaving only this simple classical structure that, again, is inward-looking, like the Pantheon or other round Roman temples that is centrally focused, inward-looking, and that is very contemplative and austere. Okay, so this early Renaissance style overwhelmingly was developed within Italy, but it did cross over the Alps somewhat and reach some other places in Europe, mainly Central and Eastern Europe, where new countries were emerging on the scene, experiencing more power and prosperity, and they had the resources to experiment with new styles. So that's where the early Renaissance first got its its first audiences outside of Italy. And this is one major example here, the castle of Moravska Trobova in Moravia. Today it's in the Czech Republic, which was built in the late 1400s. So again, it's called a castle, right? Because the building that it was replacing was actually a fortress. But by this time, Moravia was stable enough within the Holy Roman Empire that those castles could be torn down and something new, more open, more airy, more serene looking could be built instead. So you have this interesting hybrid here, right, with these long sort of neoclassical arcades and this kind of central tower uh, 
uh, entrance tower set in again with the three stories, just like you'd see in an Italian palazzo. But the roof line, the chimneys, all of these features look much more central or northern European, right? It's it's an early kind of hybrid between the vernacular styles of Central Europe and this new Renaissance aesthetic. And then the other place where the early Renaissance made inroads is in Russia. So Russia was also uh, growing and prospering on a new level. And Russia had been building more or less sort of uh, Slavic inflected Byzantine style churches and monasteries for hundreds of years. That was the familiar style, right? You'd have a Greek cross and then a central uh, rotunda over the crossing and then smaller domes on the four arms. And the outside of the church usually would be left pretty plain and you would have these sort of barrel vaults just ending on the sides of the church with these half circles. So that was the familiar form. But in the late 1400s, the Russian rulers started to bring in Italian builders to basically build new churches on the same basic design and form, but on a grander scale using the new skills of engineering and design and geometry that were being cultivated in Italy. So the first results of this were these cathedrals built within the walls of the Kremlin in Moscow, which is actually an enormous uh, fortified walled complex in the middle of Moscow. So the Cathedral of the Dormition from the 1470s and then of the Annunciation from the 1480s. And you can see with this one, they're starting to try out different uh, decorative finishing touches. They've put this uh, white plaster stucco work, plaster stucco work on the outside. They've experimented with domes at different levels, slightly different shapes. It's becoming more complex, more inventive. But then shortly after, after 1500, a third cathedral was built, the Cathedral of the Archangel, which much more than any before really combined this sort of Russian Byzantine template with the styles and motifs of the Italian Renaissance. So now you see, instead of having these sort of, uh, you know, bare cut off barrel vaults, Instead, they've turned them into these sort of scalloped fan arches. They've added in these delicately tapering, engaged pillars. Uh, even though the windows still are these sort of narrow arrow slit windows like you'd see on an older Russian church. So this is really the first dramatic effort outside of Italy to build a grand monumental building in the language, the vernacular of a different country outside Italy, but using and integrating these Italian Renaissance motifs. So let's see if we have questions. You were into grids, having just figured out linear perspective. Yeah, and a lot of a lot of these designers actually first cut their teeth as painters, and that becomes more and more of a pattern in the high Renaissance. They first learn geometry and perspective from painting, and then that sort of proves that they're ready to go into designing and building actual buildings. So in some ways, the buildings are, they're imagined first on the wall or, uh, or on the canvas, and then they, um, they leap out into real life. Okay, so let's talk about the high Renaissance. So we've seen how the, the early Renaissance really emphasized restraint, understatement to the point of being practically austere, right? Well, the high Renaissance is when new resources and money were thrown into these new grand building projects that uh, aimed at reviving a greater sense of splendor and grandeur. And the, high, the main center of the high Renaissance now was Rome, right? The early Renaissance began most of all in Florence. It was concentrated in Florence. It only gradually branched out to other places. But af after about 1500, major patrons, rich families, and especially popes began bringing this style into Rome and then pumping it up, uh, jazzing it up, 
making it into something more dramatic, more splendorous, that sought again to emphasize the the grandeur, the authority, the um, illustriousness of the papacy and the Vatican. So this is just one little example here of the uh, the rotunda in the Villa Farnese, which is a country mansion built by the Farnese family, which were what's an enormously important family in the high Renaissance because they were very rich and powerful. They produced several popes. So these, these popes, you know, we think of them as just churchmen, but really they were coming from ma rich magnate oligarchical families around Italy. And the Farnese's most of all tried to bring Renaissance humanism and Renaissance art right into the heart of the church in Rome. So the first genius, and arguably you could say the only really towering genius of the high Renaissance in architecture was Bramante. And that might sound surprising because, you know, the high Renaissance is, as the name implies, it's the height of the Renaissance. It's when this humanistic style was flourishing, when these enormous geniuses, Leonardo, Michelangelo, Raphael, were becoming famous all over Europe. But most of the really monumental work in the high Renaissance was in other art forms. It was in painting, it was in literature, sculpture. Building kind of was on the back burner in the high Renaissance, but it did factor in. And the number, again, the number one uh, genius who brought building and architecture into the high Renaissance was Bramante. And he was from a very obscure background. If I remember right, uh, I don't think we're even sure where he was born. It might've been Genoa. But he started experimenting and overseeing the rebuilding of churches in northern Italy, and particularly in Milan. And he was also at the same time a painter. And he went much further in integrating painting and building together and in using what's been called trompe l'oeil. And I'll explain in a minute what that is. But this was his first really famous design that put him on the map, Santa Maria Preso San Satiro in Milan, which was a church that needed to be rebuilt. And the patrons wanted it in a grander style and a Renaissance style. But the lot was very small. And Bramante kind of uh, was frustrated and wanted to somehow push out and make the church look more full, more grand, more open and airy, despite the small lot it was in. And this is the design he came up with. And you can see it's evocative of a Roman basilica, right? And it has these classical decorations, the coffered ceiling, and it's also basically a central plan. You have these arms of the church looking inward at this altar right here in the crossing. And the chancel extends back, right? Looks like exactly the sort of thing Bramante wanted to build. But how did he pull it off on this small lot? Well, you may have been able to tell, or maybe not, it was a trick. This uh, back chancel is not real. It is a trompe l'oeil painting, meaning trick of the eye. So he, he used geometry and perspective to create the illusion of an extended chancel that continues the motifs of the actual nave and transept. And this sort of announced Bramante to Italy as kind of the new imaginative genius who could get around the limitations of actual buildings and lots and create something that has the sort of dignity and openness of, and grandeur that the patrons wanted. So as a result, Bramante then got his first commission in Rome, and he was critical in now bringing this sort of experimental spirit of the high Renaissance into Rome itself. And so he was commissioned to redesign and rebuild San Pietro in Montorio, which is a church on the Gianicolo Hill on the outskirts of Rome which is on the site traditionally believed to be the place where St. Peter himself had been crucified. So there is a sort of specific spot in the footprint of this church that is especially holy. 
And what a medieval builder very likely would have done is they would have taken this spot, it happens to be here on this plan, and they would have built a long church around it with probably this in the center or maybe set back into the chancel and the church would face towards it. Well, that's not what Bramante did. He built this very simple, uh, you know, this very simple church with these gentle curving lines, these little half circle alcoves, uh, just simple, symmetrical. And then he set aside this courtyard and he built a perfectly circular, round, small, you could say chapel around the exact site where the crucifixion was believed to have happened. And this is what it looks like overhead, right? You've got the church here and then the side courtyard and this little circular building, which came to be called the Tempieto, the little temple, because it didn't, not only did it not look like a church, it didn't even look like a chapel. It looked like a Roman shrine. So people called it the little temple. And this is what you see if you walk into that courtyard. You see this temple that in almost looks, again, it's a kind of trick of the eye. It almost looks like an ancient Roman leftover building that is still standing and newer buildings have been built around it. <laughs> he, he creates this sort of illusion of an ancient Roman shrine sort of popping into view in the middle of this courtyard. And the Tempieto was revolutionary because it is so strictly classical. There is nothing about it that announces it as a church building, a Christian building. Again, it looks like a somehow perfectly miraculously preserved Roman structure. It uses very strict rules of balance and proportion. For example, this cornice topping off the first floor is exactly half the height to the top of the cupola. So everything is worked out to look proportional, balanced, harmonious, intentional, and also the detail work. So this is just a slightly closer view. And if you look in to the porch, you see this sort of careful, detailed uh, molding, dental work around the frieze. And then even underneath, you see this Roman style coffering, just like you would see in the inside of a Roman triumphal arch. But in this case, it's been worked in into this very small building, right? So there's an incredible amount of care and precision in exactly how this little building is shaped and decorated to maintain this sort of illusion of unity and of classical heritage. And then these are some details inside. So the Tempieto has a lower floor or crypt, and this is the exact spot where it was traditionally believed that the crucifix had been placed. And he had a cosmati floor put in to sort of radiate around that spot. And then this elaborately uh, decorated, detailed plasterwork ceiling, again, all pointing inward, emphasizing this central focal point, and also emphasizing the axis, this vertical axis running from the ground up, presumably where the crucifix would have stood, up through this ceiling and into the upper main sanctuary. And then this is the inside of the dome in the rotunda of the main chamber. And you can see here the, the Cosmati floor is in these sort of earthy colors, these browns and reds. And then the dome is painted in this soft, delicate blue with stars, like you're looking up into a night sky. And again, uh, this central focal point that everything seems to hinge around. And there's almost nothing in the entire building that breaks the sort of perfect radial symmetry of this perfect circle. So the Tempieto is a very small building, but it had a profound effect in a number of ways. Again, like sort of like Brunelleschi's dome announced the early Renaissance, the Tempieto arguably announced the high Renaissance and it announced Rome as the new capital of this new movement. And one of the effects was that Bramante became the new sort of architectural star. And he was then given the commission to redesign St. Peter's Basilica. So there had been an ancient basilica on the basic Roman, late Roman Christian form on top of the Vatican Hill 
on the western edge of Rome since the 300s. It had been started in the time of Constantine, and it had been used for over a thousand years. And as it had been used and as the Christian world had grown, it had become quite crowded and busy, and outbuildings, gatehouses had been added on until it became this sort of jumbled complex of different buildings in different styles. And it was very worn down. There was worry about the structural integrity. So in 1506, the Pope decided that it should be completely torn down and rebuilt in a new Renaissance style. And Bramante was the first designer tapped to reimagine this building. And naturally enough, Bramante being a, an ambitious high Renaissance architect, he wanted it to be on a central plan, looking inwards towards a central focal point, ideally that being the spot of the tomb of St. Peter himself. So this is the basic design he came up with, this sort of almost delicate snowflake-like pattern that would be square based, but the interior chambers would all be oriented around this simple Greek cross with four equal arms looking inward towards a central rotunda with a dome, right? So this was his kind of dream design for this new basilica. And this is not what ended up being built. And I'll explain later how this shook out. But basically, the, the basic idea that Bramante put forward was eventually realized in some way, in the sense that if you look at St. Peter's as it was eventually completed, there is this long sweep with four arms of the church looking inwards towards a central focal point. Um, and this, this is a later uh, canopy added in by Bernini. We'll talk about that later. But connected to these four arms, there are these side chapels that are very open and wide and are entered through these wide half circle archways. So in many respects, the sort of spirit of Bramante's idea was realized, but a lot of changes had to be made to accommodate what the patrons wanted and to, to be structurally sound. But this was the idea and the project began with Bernini, or sorry, with Bramante at its head starting in 1506, and it would continue for decades all through the rest of the 1500s. So while that was going on, the High Renaissance also shifted over and was adopted in domestic architecture as well, right? So again, there was this sort of interplay, like in the High Renaissance, there was an interplay between church building and home and palace building. And Rome sort of exploded with new homes, both palazzi, which are, you know, urban townhouses, and villas, which are more sort of country houses around or outside the city. And they were also reimagined in new ways. And really, the first dramatic one was built was a really a palazzo built for the Chigi family, which was a major banking family from Siena that did business with the papacy. Uh, today, we call it the Villa Farnesina because it was it changed hands, but originally it was for the Kiji family, and it was designed by two disciples of Bramante, right? So Bramante now was busy working on St. Peter's, but his students, his apprentices, his disciples got commissions building these new homes. And this was an example here. This is a drawing of the facade of the Kiji mansion, uh, symmetrical, balanced, again, these uh, gentle arcades, these uh, stacked, uh, engaged pillars, giving it a, a sort of balanced, open, classical look. But what really set this mansion apart and made it uh, stunning and revolutionary was the fresco paintings. So entire rooms of this mansion were covered in trompe l'oeil frescoes. It's now no longer something you just do against the back wall of a church and say, ha ha ha, I tricked you and made you think this church was bigger than it is. It now becomes something that happens in 360 degrees in the round so that you can be transported into imaginary places and environments. And again, the, the decoration here in the Kiji mansion is completely classical. There is not a single religious note anywhere. I've been there. I looked for it. There's nothing. <laughs> There's the family motto at one point on the ceiling, which has a Christian reference, and that's it. It's all classical. It's all based on surviving 
Roman villas. So this is one little slice, but this is what the room actually looks like, uh, or one corner of the room. And you can see there's this clever trompe l'oeil. Th th this is not a real porch. There's no real city out here. This is all fake. But there's this kind of obsession with, with perspective and the illusion of three-dimensionality and the way that it can be used to create fake places, imaginary places. And this sort of technique was carried over into other mansions and palazzi. And this one, the Palazzo Farnese, so again, this was the city home of the very powerful Farnese family, which produced several popes. And this is the one that sort of set the tone and set the pace for the rest of Renaissance home building. So it's the three stories. Again, the, the first story, the most plain utilitarian looking. And then it becomes more light and more delicate as you go up story by story. And it almost looks as if the upper floor is starting to kind of lift off and float away into the air. And then it's finished off with this heavy cornice that nonetheless has very light, delicate ornamentation on it. So it doesn't just look heavy and imposing. And this is a very interesting house too, because it kind of, it's almost like a little archeological site. The first stories, the first and second stories were designed by Sangallo, a disciple of, uh, of Bramante, who also worked on the Kiji mansion. But then they fired him. The Farnese's fired him and said, no, there's this new guy on the block who has made his mark as a painter, and we want to see what he can build. And that was Michelangelo Buonarroti. So they had Michelangelo design the final story to finish it off. And this is the courtyard. So again, there's this interest in central inward looking forms. And you can see in the courtyard again, simple, austere, uh, Tuscan order, or actually a uh, Doric order, first floor arcade, kind of utilitarian, very plain, done in this uh, fine grained, dark colored sandstone. Second floor, a little slightly embellished, right? In these engaged pillars, these little uh, archways. Then Michelangelo put on the final floor and he uses this lighter colored stone. It looks lighter, more airy, more reflective, brighter. And he uses this much finer, more detailed ornamentation. So it almost looks as if the building is sort of slowly coming to life as you go up from floor to floor. And so in this way, it's it's a chimera, right? It's it's really an early Renaissance style, lower register, and then high Renaissance on top. But this then served as the model for subsequent palazzi through the rest of the Renaissance. And then the same family, the Farnese, is also built an even more monumental country house or villa in the town of Caprarola, north of Rome. And Again, you can see some of the same basic idea or structure, right? Sort of three registers, fortress-like, sturdy, then a little lighter, then a final story on top. But in all kinds of ways, this, this building is sort of crazier than anything anyone had done before. For one thing, it gives the illusion of just being a normal rectangular mansion. It's really a pentagon facing inward towards a central circular courtyard. So it's getting weird, kind of fantastical. And the inside is vibrant and richly embellished. So this is sort of the piece de resistance of the Villa Farnese, this central staircase, which is covered on all sides and all around by these rich, uh, fantastical uh, fresco paintings that are roughly based on Roman models, but really are just something inventive, new, uh, exuberant, and that, again, emphasize the the central design, right? The perfection of curves and circles and the central focal point. So this is what it looks like looking up from the ground floor into this staircase up towards that rotunda that we saw before, right? Something much more dazzling, uh, much more uh, vibrant. It seems to be coming to life. This is way beyond what would have been done in the early Renaissance in the 1400s. And the high Renaissance style also crosses the Alps and it reaches more of Western Europe. And particularly now after 1500, certain monarchies in Western Europe are becoming more powerful and have more stable 
central control over their kingdoms. And they become the first patrons to bring Italian high Renaissance architects into their countries outside Italy, and also to send their own builders to Rome to learn the high Renaissance style. So these are a couple big examples, the Palace of Fontainebleau in France, built in the 1520s and 30s. You can see it still has some of these older sort of tower-like elements like you'd see in a castle, but now they're sort of topped off with these gently sloping mansard roofs and these uh, little dormers. And there are these horizontal bands and elements, the large windows. You know, a large window in a way, it's a way of showing off and saying, we're not worried anyone's going to come attack us. And instead we can have these big open glass windows out to look out onto the landscape and onto our domains. And then a somewhat more kind of dramatic and imposing example is the palace of the Emperor Charles V, who was probably the most powerful ruler in Europe at this time. He was Holy Roman Emperor and King of Spain. And he built this Renaissance style palace in Granada. And you can see here the lower floor is in this much heavier uh, so-called Tuscan order, which it looks more crude, more fortress-like. It evokes old Etruscan ruins that you'd see in Tuscany. And then this sort of lighter, more delicate, more refined upper register above it. But again, the sort of rectangle and circle motif repeated, giving it almost, almost the look of like a reflection in water. But what really makes this palace <clears throat> in Granada so extraordinary is what's inside. There's a circular courtyard with this central uh, circular focal point. And this just, nothing like this had been seen before, certainly not since the Roman age. This enormous, sweeping, perfectly circular, uh, curving porch with these delicate, slender pillars holding up the sloping roof. Uh, and it's almost like a sundial, right? You can see the sun coming through into the courtyard, moving across this delicately colonnaded uh, tableau through the course of the day. This was, uh, it was grand, it was ambitious, it was balanced, harmonious. It was sort of uh, a realization of the Renaissance vision that was a lot more difficult to pull off in Italy, where not many people had the money and the real estate to build something like this, but Charles V could. And then it also moved into Central Europe. There are a couple examples here, especially in Prague. People took Romanesque and Gothic buildings like uh, St. George's Church in Prague and added on these dramatic Renaissance elements. <clears throat> so this is a portal added onto the church. And again, you can see it's sort of mimicking a triumphal arch and it has this coffering inside, but to really show it off, they tilted it downward. So you can see as you approach the church, this delicate Roman style rosette coffering. And then this is the summer palace built by the Habsburg rulers in Prague, which is very interesting because it has, again, this Renaissance style rounded arcade, uh, you know, could be an Italian Renaissance palazzo, but then the roof line is very distinctively Central European, like you would see uh, with this sort of uh, OG arch hipped roof, like you'd see in Bohemia or Germany. So again, there's this move to combine familiar local vernaculars with the classicizing motifs of the high Renaissance. Okay, so let me check. Okay, um, great. So yeah, no questions yet. So you could say the high, the high Renaissance sort of reached a certain peak of grandeur and uh, classical dignity, balance. But eventually by the 1530s, a lot of designers, even within Rome, were trying to push these bounds, right? They were getting tired of these conventions of symmetry, balance, of the repeating orders of uh, Doric, Ionic, Corinthian. And they wanted to try something more surprising, more mysterious, more atmospheric. And so eventually they start to break these familiar conventions. And this leads to what we think of as the late Renaissance. 
So this is possibly the first late Renaissance palazzo, the Palazzo Massimi, designed by Peruzzi in Rome. And you can see right away the shape of it is weird, right? This is not a trick of the camera or of perspective. This is the actual shape of the facade. It bows outward and bends in the middle. So it looks almost like it's it's sort of pressing out, looming into the streetscape. And it has these registers of windows, but the upper registers are just strange. They don't, this is not a familiar shape. They don't have the engaged pillars around them like you'd expect on a classical window. It's this weird, almost like picture frame shape, and they're too small to see through. It almost looks like something secret might be going on in these upper floors. <clears throat> and then if you look at the street level, it's broken into, the facade is broken into by this alcove, this entrance alcove, that then is screened off. Oop, excuse me. That then is screened off by this colonnade. Again, as if something uh, secret or private or mysterious is going on. It's a little bit more, you could say, inviting and forbidding at the same time. It seems to have a, it, there's something unexpected about it, something alluring about it. It is not just this grand, dignified, perfectly symmetrical palazzo like you would have seen with Palazzo Farnese. And this is kind of the cutting edge then of this move to, to experiment, to try strange curving forms, uh, unusual arrangements of elements. And this is another example outside Rome, the Villa Giulia designed by Giorgio Vasari and Vignola. And some of you may have heard of Vasari, who is also famous for his biographies of artists, but he was an artist and designer himself. And you can see here, this is a villa, so it's a home, but it is this horseshoe shape, almost like a theater, like a Roman theater, as if uh, when you're approaching it, something maybe is about to happen. There's some display or activity that's going to go on and you're being enveloped by it. And then it has these side wings that project outward that don't even have windows. They just have alcoves maybe for statuary, but you can't even tell what they are or what's going on. There's this air of, of mystery and surprise and strangeness. And then the master really of domestic uh, late Renaissance building, who brought this new style to a kind of height of fame and perfection, was Andrea Palladio, who built mainly in and around the town of Vicenza in northeastern Italy, in the Veneto, so the, the territory of the Republic of Venice. So this is a place where the Renaissance hadn't been so much before. It was not really part of those early and high Renaissance moments. It was kind of off unto itself. Venice was a city that was already like full. There was no space left and it was crowded with largely Venetian Gothic buildings. But a lot of the big Venetian families had country homes and estates around Vicenza. And they commissioned Palladio to try out new things, to sort of make an impression. And he built, for one thing, this Palazzo Chiaricati in the town of Vicenza. And you can see it just doesn't fit any model that we're familiar with, right? It's not these three layers delicately balanced and stacked on one, one on top of another. It, most of the facade is recessed far back, so it's shaded by these projecting canopies and screened off by these kind of fat bowed out columns. Again, as if something is being hidden. And there's just this one section that projects forth out towards you, like the audience. And then above it, this weird, you know, this cornice with these weird statues and ornaments, just totally experimental, not mimicking any building that anyone was familiar with. And this is what Palladio did in much of the mid 1500s until he started to kind of work out his own aesthetic standards of what an ideal home should look like. And this was a major example, the Villa Capra, also simply called La Rotonda, which was built in the countryside outside Vicenza just a few years later. And here you can see Palladio is starting to work out his ideas, right? He still has these dramatic uh, towering statues over the entablatures, 
but it's a central design, central domed focal point, and then these four porches projecting out from all four sides, as if looking out and reaching out to the land around it. And something that was really important about Palladio and his vision was that the building should harmonize with the environment. It shouldn't just tower over it. It should look outward and reach outward as if it is sort of blending and combining with the land around it. And he was very intentional about where buildings should be sited, that they should be in a prominent enough spot to have a view and to be visible, but they should not dominate the landscape. And this became his uh, signature style and <clears throat> soon became kind of de rigueur all around Northern Italy. And he put a lot of his ideas and even his designs, including unbuilt designs, into a series of books, simply called the Four Books of Architecture, which were published first in Venice in 1570. And you can see an example here of one of his unbuilt designs for the Villa Tricino. And again, it's this central plan building, right, facing inward towards the central rotunda, but at the same time projecting, reaching outward to the land around it. And then it has these forward projecting wings in front that seem to kind of reach outward and forward, embracing the land, right? Embracing the lawn, the garden, whatever this sort of special half enclosed space is that the visitor would pass through as they approach the building. So this is a new kind of design, right? It's not an enclosed courtyard with building all around it. It's not an open garden space. It's this sort of semi-enclosed space as if the building and the land are starting to bleed together. And this became sort of the, the standard then of good taste for the, the upper class that wanted grand homes, that wanted to host people in grand homes in Italy, and also to some degree in other countries in France and Germany. And then after making his mark here, he was commissioned also to build church buildings and civic buildings. And he, again, kind of revolutionized these as well. So this is a major example, this, the Basilica of San Giorgio Maggiore in Venice, which he built in 1565. And I call it a late Renaissance chimera because what Palladio set out to do was to take a basilica with the basic familiar profile, right? The high nave in the center and then the side aisles, the lower side aisles on either side. And he set out to give it a classical facade as if it was an ancient Greco-Roman temple. But that's impossible because, right, this is not the shape of a Greek or Roman temple. So what he did is he looked at this shape and he imagined it as two temple facades one layered on top of the other. So this one, you could say the first layer is like a Greek temple. And he said, okay, this is like a Greek style entablature. And it has these engaged pillars supporting the entablature, like you would see in say the Parthenon. And then he said at the same time, this part is like a Roman temple with a taller profile, more verticalist, more towering. And he put another set of engaged pillars that smushes right over top of the Greek entablature. So he's sort of combining them both together into one in one space, which is something that an earlier Renaissance designer would have never tried to do. They would have said, no, you're ruining the look of a classical building. But Palladio kind of gave people permission to do these more crazy things, to break these rules in order, in a sense, to capture the mood right, the, the atmosphere of a classical building, even as they broke the familiar rules and patterns, right? You could say he's sort of putting the spirit over the letter. And then others followed in similar sort of ways. So this is uh, the Uffizi, which was the uh, city offices of Florence. Now it's a museum in Florence, designed by Giorgio Vasari. And again, it's hard to know what even to say about this, but if you look at it, the elements, the pillars, the cornices, the little entablatures over the windows, these are classical elements, but they're being thrown together here in a completely unfamiliar way, right? You have this uh, colonnaded porch and then over it, this weird little miniature story, almost as if there's like a little munchkin tunnel here. 
and then a higher story with these windows, and then another story with just plain square windows, like little casement windows. Doesn't, doesn't look like anything anyone would have seen before. It's elements being taken and mixed and matched and tried out in different combinations just to create something dramatic, something surprising. And this becomes kind of the spirit of the late Renaissance. And as the, all of this is happening, people are trying to build St. Peter's. And builders find that Bramante's plan isn't going to work. And one of the main uh, designers who comes to this conclusion is Michelangelo, who again is brought in to sort of complete this project that had been started by an earlier designer. And one of the things he concludes is that uh, this design isn't going to hold up a big dome. It's just not strong enough. These piers are too small. It doesn't hold and distribute the weight properly. So he has to reimagine things and say, okay, well, we need these big, giant, sturdy piers that are really going to be able to hold up a big rotunda. And then in order to keep this sense of sort of openness and airiness, we're going to knock out some of the smaller piers and supports and create this sort of complete square around the rotunda and will lengthen the nave, which really the papacy wanted. You know, they, they, they were like, we don't know which way to face in a Greek cross church like this. We want a nice Latin cross where people enter, they see that they're heading back towards the rotunda and then the chancel, which is where the mass will actually happen. So he extended this nave <clears throat> and got these sort of somewhat open oblong side chapels nestled into the side aisles and then this complete sort of ambulatory all around this central rotunda with the four big piers and this is what the nave looks like so michelangelo oversaw building of much of the fabric and then carlo maderno finally was brought in to do the sort of finishing touches and the decoration in the late 1500s and you can see it's soaring it's monumental and in certain ways, it is innovative. You have these enormous flat engaged pillars reaching all the way up to this high cornice, almost like in a Gothic building, right? These dramatic soaring vertical elements. But then they're separated by these gently curving arches with this delicate gold leaf coffering that ends up giving the whole thing a look of sort of lightness and airiness, despite the extreme, huge, thick, heavy structural elements. Right? They, they avoid allowing the building to just look heavy and imposing, and also they avoid letting it look dark, because this is not a Gothic building with enormous towering windows. It has very small windows, but with this gold leaf, they make it more reflective, more bright, almost glowing. This is the rotunda. So here you see these four huge, thick, heavy piers, which an early Renaissance designer never would have allowed. They would have said that looks too imposing, too heavy. It lacks the sort of delicate balance of a classical building. But by the late Renaissance, people were willing to try that out and then lighten it with statuary, small uh, ornamentation like on these Corinthian pillars, these bands of gold, th these small articulations to make it look lighter so that you don't notice that you're looking at one enormous thick stone pier that is big enough to really be an entire building. We're going to look at, you know, if you think of the Pazzi Chapel from earlier, that whole thing would fit into one of these piers, right? So it was a real task to make this whole structure look light, airy, soaring, despite its enormity. And just to emphasize that, that this is the picture I started out with at the beginning. And it's looking into one of these little side chapels in St. Peter's. And something interesting you, you, you notice in St. Peter's is that there aren't these huge windows all around, again, like in a Gothic building. They're smaller, they're more selective, and they're very carefully placed around the upper stories of the building so that you always notice where the shafts of light are coming in and what they're illuminating. And it gives the whole building this sort of uh, almost heavenly look. Right, And you have all these vertical elements, these statues reaching upward, these huge tall pillars. Everything seems to be reaching upward towards these points of light that then move around the building over the course of the day. And it gives this sense of constant motion and activity and change 
as the sunlight moves and shifts through the building. And it happens that in this picture, uh, this is a Latin inscription from that same passage in the Gospels where uh, Christ says to Peter, uh, whatever you uh, bind on earth will be bound in heaven, right? Et in coelis, and in the heavens, in the sky. Uh, so it, it again, it, it, it underscores this, this idea of a direct link, right, from the earths to the heavens. And you may notice here, this is a clock, right? But it's a weird clock. Uh, it's a six-hour clock. So it's a clock that moves around and chimes once every six hours. And that is tracing out the cycle of prayers, of the, pr the, the prayers that take place at the different times of the day, in the morning, noon, evening, and midnight, that are always performed every day and every night in St. Peter's. So again, it's it's uh, on this. It shows this theme of St. Peter's always being active and always being responding to the time of day, the motions of the sun and the day and night. And the late Renaissance, of course, this one moves abroad much more really, than even the earlier High Renaissance did. And most of all, it's taken up by these wealthy, powerful rulers. Like this is El Escorial, the monastery palace built by King Philip II of Spain, which has all sorts of Renaissance elements, but is now more monumental, more enormous, more imposing than any Renaissance building we've seen before. If you're up close to it, just the sheer horizontal sweep, this uninterrupted horizontal line with these tiny windows, it underscores the tremendous size and the tremendous number of people that would have been moving about the activity. The This was the nerve center of the massive Spanish empire, and it's designed to look that way. Again, no early Renaissance architect would have countenanced this. But at this time and with these patrons, this was appealing. And this is just a view in the library of El Escorial with these repeating globes, right? Emphasizing world power, uh, the, the reach of the power of this ruler and his state all around the world, which then is echoed in these long sweeping vertical, uh, sorry, horizontal lines, you know, as if as if this library and all the knowledge packed into it could just reach on forever. And then in subtler ways, it's taken up again in France and in more Northern countries. This is one beautiful example, the uh, Chateau of Chenonceau. So this was not the first Chateau in France to be redesigned on a Renaissance model. But part of what's so special about it is that they kept the older, really late Gothic style, little fortress-like castle that is perched on a platform on the edge of the river. And then later in the 1500s, when they were ready to extend it, they had these Renaissance Italian-trained French designers build first a bridge and then a projecting wing over top of the bridge, which uh, sort of leaps out from the side of this verticalist Gothic building and has this gently uh, repeating kind of rhythmic motif running all the way across the length, echoing the uh, the gentle half circle arches of the bridge. So again, this sense of, of reach, of breadth, uh, this horizontalist emphasis on space. In this case, you know, sort of uh, in a very showy, right, theatrical way, reaching all across the river, right, representing the the extent of this Lord's power on both sides of the river. And then lastly, I'll just talk a little about England. Um, so England, the Renaissance did reach England as well, but in the most kind of transformed and distorted form. You see very few sort of standard issue Italian Renaissance style buildings in England. Rather, what happened is that certain Renaissance ideas and motifs were brought in and blended with the familiar local vernacular. And more than in any other country, the sort of rising English gentry, which was becoming more wealthy at this time, they wanted to evoke and build upon uh, 
the sort of native traditions and atmosphere of the country house, the country manor house, and the country hunting lodge. And there's this continuing emphasis on domesticity, the sort of security and comfort of the home, and connectedness to the land. So these are some very early Tudor houses. This is just a yeoman's house, very modest, in Sussex. And you can see, you know, it has the thatch roof. It has sort of wattle and daub plaster put into timber work, very plain looking. But at the same time, it has this careful symmetry, this little central archway uh, with the central recessed space, the little casement windows. They're going for a sort of look of refinement and dignity in this very vernacular country form. And then this is a slightly grander house, a manor house in Oxfordshire. And here you see a, a sort of similar design being expanded and elaborated on. There's this sort of central recessed space, which is horizontalist. It looks broad. There's this long roof, right? It's, it's breadth. It's, it looks spacious, comfortable. But then it's bracketed at either end by these strong vertical elements. In this case, these big uh, vertical gables, peaked gables, and the chimneys right? The chimneys sort of uh, finish off either end of the building. And this was very innovative because previous vernacular country homes didn't have fireplaces. They just had a central hearth and then a hole in the roof so the smoke can go out. Well, in the 1500s, they started building brickwork fireplaces into the ends and then chimneys to channel the smoke out. And so this was a sign of, of comfort, of elegance in the sort of context of a modest country home. This is the interior of Alston Court in Suffolk. So you can see the warm uh, woodwork, the sort of earthiness of the contrast between the brown woodwork and the white plaster work. And then again, at the end in this recessed space, a fireplace with a chimney, right? And this more and more becomes kind of the focus of the English home. Right? Everything looks towards that sort of comforting, warm, inviting fireplace parlor. And this country style then gets taken up by the urban bourgeoisie, right? The, the merchants, the, the town officials, the lawyers, they start to build these Tudor style homes that mimic the country houses of the country gentry. And again, you have this central recessed space, this sort of protected private entranceway and then the high gables on either end and the chimneys on either end. So this becomes sort of the symbol of the dignified kind of upper middle class of England. And in certain ways it's taken up and adapted by the royals too. So this is probably the most famous, most viewed uh, Tudor building, Hampton Court Palace built for uh, Henry VII and Henry VIII. And this is in brick, right? So it's an upgrade. And it does have these sort of castle-like elements. But again, you see this sort of central recessed entranceway and then bracketed by these vertical elements. And you see the emphasis on smoke uh, chimneys, right? Representing comfort, domesticity. And then this is the Great Hall inside Hampton Court Palace, which has this very elaborate hammer beam rafter roof. And this is an interesting blend, right? This this hammer beam roof is kind of gothic, right? And the window set into the, the end is gothic. But the little vegetable, you know, uh, kind of garden-like decorative woodwork looks much more Renaissance, like you would see in a Renaissance palazzo. The tapestries on the walls, this little classical decorative frieze, very Renaissance, right? So England is doing a very conscious blending of their local familiar medieval styles with Renaissance motifs. And again, the references to hunting, right? The, these antlers, these heads evoke the hunting lodge, which was still kind of the, uh, the epitome of royal comfort, luxury, and dignity. And also just lastly, you can see, this is a peaked arch like you would see in a Gothic building. And this window has a little peaked arch, right? But it's so subtle. Right? The arch has been widened out almost to a perfect curve, but there's still a subtle peak there. 
which you can take to kind of symbolize the Tudor style. And it's been called the Tudor arch, right? It's this sort of careful compromise between the Gothic and the Renaissance. And you see it repeated here in the exterior, right? The This entranceway and this window on the Great Hall. This is the, the sort of blend, right? The, the hybrid of Tudor. Now, lastly, as for Tudor, this is the only building I think I'm going to mention in this lecture that no longer stands, but I just had to include it. This is Nonesuch Palace, <clears throat> which is the Grand Hunting Lodge Palace built into a royal parkland outside of London for Henry VIII in 1538. And this was really the favorite home of Henry VIII and Elizabeth I. And I think in this picture, this is a depiction of Elizabeth riding up uh, to ready to make her entrance into her palace. And it's basically a Tudor hunting lodge blown up to a monumental scale. And again, it uses this woodwork and plaster work to give it this sort of rustic, home-like texture, even as it is so extravagant and so monumental. And again, it has this long horizontal sweep in the center bracketed by these dramatic vertical elements, right? Mimicking the look of a grand medieval castle palace, but put into this much more kind of earthy, organic material. And I, I just think this surely was the masterpiece of Tudor. Uh, people were amazed by it. People painted it. Um, about 130 years later, King Charles II gave it as a gift to one of his mistresses who then dismantled it and sold off the pieces in order to pay off her gambling debts. So it is the lost masterpiece of Tudor. And then lastly, the sort of apotheosis of Tudor is the Elizabethan house, the Elizabethan so-called prodigy house, these sort of uh, extravagant country homes that were built more or less in the Tudor style. Again, the same basic layout, the recessed central uh, entranceway, the towers bracketing it, but in stone, right? To show greater permanence, greater dignity. This is Hardwick Hall, which was built for the second richest woman in England after the queen, who was Bess of Hardwick. And uh, she built it to be a kind of non-royal palace to even compete with the queen herself. And uh, you would have entered up this long walk into a grand hall. And then if you were lucky, you could go up the stairs into her chamber, which is, you know, sumptuous and decorated in this lavish Renaissance style, right? With these uh, frescoes and relief sculptures and this marble fireplace. Again, this sort of central focus on the fireplace as the center of the home. And then lastly, the late Renaissance was adapted in its own way also in the East in Russia. And so we've seen some of the basilicas and cathedrals that were built in Russia. Well, as the, the sort of trend, the spirit of experimentation spread with the late Renaissance, Russian designers started kind of going back to the traditional forms of Slavic churches, small country churches and monasteries most of which probably were in wood, and put them into stonework. And an early example here, the Church of the Ascension in a park in Moscow, uh, it has these weird sort of radiating uh, successive peaked arches and this central octagon tower. And this is significant because it's one of the very few forerunners that you can find that seems as if it must have been an inspiration in some way for St. Basil's Cathedral which is so totally unique, <laughs> it's so imaginative, so exuberant, so inventive, it's hard to compare it to any other building in the world. I mean, you can just see the incredible concatenation of patterns, colors, uh, this full embrace of onion domes, which are said to represent candle flames. So if you look at the form of, uh, of the cathedral, it's arguably symbolic of like a candelabra, like you might have seen in a temple or like, like the menorah in Solomon's temple. It might be in part a reference to this increasing interest and fascination with Solomon's temple. But to look at how 
the church works. It actually is one central church, and then around it, eight other smaller churches, each with its own altar that could perform masses separately. So it's really not exactly a cathedral or a church. It's a complex of nine churches connected by these interwoven passageways like this that you see here. And you know how to even describe it, the incredible lavishness and complexity, the incredible detail work. Uh, it's hard to say how, we don't know who designed it. It was probably a series of designers kind of throwing ideas together. And one possibility is that there was some inspiration taken from the royal tent encampments that were seen in Central Asia. And the building was actually started by the Tsar Ivan IV as a way to celebrate his victory over the Khanate of Astrakhan in the Volga, which was an old surviving so-called Tatar or Central Asian Turco-Mongolic kingdom. And, you know, this is a depiction of the royal tent encampment or Ordu of Genghis Khan. It's hard to find good depictions of these Central Asian tent cities. But this is one from several hundred years earlier. But you can imagine that possibly these this sort of series of peaked tents, each with its own textile pattern, might have then been an inspiration for these onion domes, each with its own color scheme and pattern, sort of clustered together around this grand central tower, which maybe uh, mimics or echoes the sort of grand tent of the emperor. But really, you know, <laughs> it's a mystery who came up with this and why and how, but it's just an incredibly stunning, uh, unique architectural creation. And as this was going on in Russia, finally, there was um, there was a similar sort of push towards greater, more dazzling exuberance within Rome itself, to the point that eventually the late Renaissance arguably again reached a limit where it just became too extravagant to the point that it was hard to make sense of what you were even looking at. But this is often pointed to as either the, the last late Renaissance building or the first Baroque building depending on how you want to define it. And this is the Church of the Jesu built for the Jesuit order at their headquarters in Rome in the 1570s. And you can see it's taking a lot of inspiration from St. Peter's, you know, the elaborate gold work, the, the reflective surfaces, this sort of sunburst over the altarpiece. But it also is making heavy use of these frescoes. And this is an interesting one because this fresco is just depicting clouds in the sky, and it's uninterrupted in the upper end of the apse, such that it can almost look like the apse is just melting away, and you're just looking through the building out into open space. And this is a very dazzling building, but in some ways it can, the problem is that it can look kind of overwhelming, kind of jumbled, right? And the question then was, how do you take these sort of multiplying elements of ornamentation, light, motion, painting, sculpture, and somehow fit them into some scheme that makes sense, that can be followed, that looks more coherent. And that is what led to the Baroque. But uh, before, let's see, do we have chat? Okay. Um, so lastly, let's talk about what is the Baroque. Oh, and just, okay, one other note. There's there's a reason why churches like the Jesu started to look like this, and it was partly theological, because the Reformation had started in Northern Europe, and reformers, especially in the Swiss Reformation, uh, condemned images and embellishment in churches, and often went around and stripped out frescoes, tapestries, all of that. And they wanted a, an austere, simple church like this one, the Cathedral of Geneva, which was the actual church of John Calvin, where he preached. They wanted it to just focus on the pulpit, right? The place where the word is preached out, right? With no distraction, no visual distraction, and nothing that could be seen as uh, idolatry. Well, in response, the Council of Trent, 
met to to deal with and respond to these Protestant arguments and these Protestant attacks on traditional Latin worship. And one of the things they said was uh, art and music are valid parts of, of worship and they should inspire reverence and piety. So this became uh, a sort of Tridentine style growing out of the Council of Trent, which intentionally mobilized all of these art forms to create something dazzling that appeals to the senses in contradistinction to these stripped down Protestant churches. So you can see this as a sort of contest between the Protestant Reformation focused on the word and this Catholic Reformation that embraced image and sound and appeal to the senses. So this is what then leads to the Baroque. It's this question of how do you how do you mobilize these art forms and create something astounding and dazzling that nonetheless is coherent and focused and doesn't just look chaotic. And the great master of Baroque was Bernini, just as uh, Brunelleschi was the first master of the early Renaissance, Bramante of the high Renaissance. Well, it was Bernini in the Baroque. And this is an image of the Cornaro Chapel, which he designed in Rome, and the sculpture that he sculpted himself as the centerpiece, uh, which in a way ties together and focuses this whole uh, this whole chapel that otherwise could just look chaotic, right? And the model and the inspiration for Baroque building, most of all, was actually theater. And you can see the Baroque as a sort of effort to put on theatrical displays in permanent stone form. So the basic principles of Baroque are motion, vitality, complexity, the, the building should look alive and active, universality, it should tie together elements and harmonize contending forces to create a sense of unity out of what would otherwise be chaotic. And in a lot of ways, the Baroque really is the imperial style par excellence. A lot of the patrons of Baroque were rulers or institutions like the Jesuits that had now enormous global reach and global empires. And they wanted to show that they had the power and the mastery to sort of gather uh, knowledge, resources together into one central capital, right? And this is a fairly typical Baroque facade. This is the Cathedral of Noto in Sicily. And you can see it doesn't have the sort of harmony and symmetry and simplicity of, say, the Palazzo Farnese. It's a broken facade. There are projecting elements that seem to leap forward out at us, and then recessed elements that kind of hide behind them in shadow. There are statues uh, that look active, that have motion. Uh, this is, it, it almost, a Baroque facade almost looks like a whole city gathered together into one building. So these repeating elements, you have complex and broken facades, oval, elliptical, and undulating interiors. This is an example in the, the chapel of San Carlo alle Quattro, Quattro Fontane in Rome, which I'll talk about later. You know, it looks almost alive, like an organism, moving, pulsating. Statuary and frescoes that convey action. And then these dramatic elements that that convey activity and direction like staircases and fountains and classical ornaments but in strange and surprising configurations and as i said the real inspiration for baroque is theater and this is an example of the design of the set for a passion play a, a, a long play cycle dramatizing the whole life and death of christ that was put on in France in 1547. And you can see this represents hell with people coming out of this monster's mouth. This represents Herod's palace. This represents the temple. You have these different buildings kind of projecting, leaping out at us, and then quiet spaces, Nazareth, uh, Limbo back here that are sort of recessed back into the background. And everything looks as if it's set up for characters to appear and act and interact. 
And this then was the model then for the earliest Baroque buildings. So arguably, this is kind of the germination of the Baroque, again, in Sicily. So this is the Piazza Villena, or so-called Quattro Canti, or Four Corners. So this is an intersection where the Habsburg rulers of Sicily decided to you know, demolish what was there, rebuild, create these long sweeping avenues. And then at the four corners set in these four facades, each of which looks kind of like a theatrical stage, right? Set up with these tiers, uh, with these statues uh, of rulers and saints, as if you're about to witness a play put on for you. And again, these four elements, right? The four cardinal directions being tied together in this one unified composition. It represents power, unity, and at the same time, activity, motion, life. And then this is arguably the first complete Baroque building, the Palazzo Barberini in, uh, in Rome, which was designed by Carlo Maderno, who I mentioned, who worked on St. Peter's and Bernini. And this, again, if you look at this palazzo, it's not a plain, simple, flat facade like we've seen before. It has this central projecting facade as if it's like a stage, right? And these wings, almost like the wings of a theater, looking inward at this central stage with these big dramatic windows, as if you're about to see figures appear and put on a scene, right? It's very showy. It's very dramatic. And then this is in the interior, some rooms. This is the Grand Salon. And the wall, th this would have been too bizarre right, for a standard Renaissance designer. This sheer wall, featureless, except for this gold leaf coffering, and then this weird cluster of entranceways with these heavy porticos, and then this huge uh, fresco on the ceiling. And it's designed as if the whole point of the room is just to draw your eye upward and make you look at this complex, dramatic uh, fresco ceiling, which, of course, these visitors are doing, right? This is the classic scene you see in the Grand Salon, is people lying on their back just to gaze up into this dazzling fresco. And the Palazzo also established this Baroque pattern of long galleries with big windows and gold leaf and frescoes, uh, all reflecting the light, looking dazzling, overwhelming. And that's repeated, of course, in Versailles and multiple other Baroque buildings. And then, of course, as I mentioned before, uh, the Cornaro Chapel is sort of seen as Bernini's masterpiece. And the central figure here, this sculpture, is the ecstasy of St. Teresa. So St. Teresa of Avila reported having ecstatic visions where she would experience overpowering emotions and sensations. And this scene depicted here is a vision where she said that she, an angel appeared to her and repeatedly stabbed her in the heart. Uh, but instead of pain, she felt pleasure. You know, you can interpret that however you want, but this sort of epitomizes the idea and the spirit of the Baroque, right? That art should capture powerful emotion, overpowering sensations, and that the colors, the forms, the textures should look as if they're bursting forth, uh, coming to life. Uh, appropriate to the power of the scene that they're depicting. And again, it's very theatrical, right? You have this projecting uh, entablature, which is curved and broken, as if almost as if the scene of the angel and St. Teresa is breaking through and bursting out at us. And then to the sides, these are the patrons, the Cornaro family, in sort of opera boxes, viewing the scene, right? It's recreating a theater. And then Bernini's uh, bigger masterpiece, his big exterior masterpiece, it was building these projecting wings around the piazza in front of St. Peter's. So this is how St. Peter's looks today after it's been completed, right? So you have Bramante's and Michelangelo's design, the dome, this elliptical dome designed by Michelangelo, the Baroque facade by Moderna, and then uh, this piazza laid out with this wrapping a colonnade by Bernini. And then another important Baroque designer we have to know about was sort of Bernini's uh, insane rival, you could say, Francesco Borromini. Uh, 
who was even more audacious in the way that he sort of manipulated and twisted and exaggerated the fabric of a building beyond what Bernini would even try to do, uh, to the extent that he didn't get the big commissions that Bernini did, but he made small buildings that made really dramatic, impactful statements. So this is the Chapel of San Carlo alle Quattro Fontane, and you can see Again, this is not a lens distortion. I mean, the, the cornice up here, it might be a little distorted by a sort of fisheye lens effect, but it really does bow and undulate like this, right? And you see this sort of curving, almost sensuous uh, line, like the shape of uh, a human body. And the these figures seem to sort of come to life, coming out at you, out of this like undulating, curving facade. And then again, on the upper cornice, it's broken, right? There's this element that sort of thrusts upward and breaks through it. And this is what it looks like inside, right? These almost organic, curving elliptical and oval forms interlocking in this weird kind of shell-like shape. And this is a very narrow space. This is another chapel that would have fit entirely within one of those piers in the middle of St. Peter's. But what Borromini has done is he's exploited every little inch he can to create this dramatic effect of, of movement, of life. And it looks different, right? Any, as you walk into this building or walk around it, any inch you move, the whole form seems to rearrange into new shapes, new forms. And this is another example of that, the dome of Santivo alla Sapienza, which is irregular, right? It, it, I mean, what is this? Like, <laughs> this, was, this was so weird that the big patrons in Rome were afraid to even go down this road. But given the chance, this is the sort of thing Borromini did, right? This strange alternating shape of, of ribbed sections of this dome, which again, can't really be fitted into any familiar shape. And they seem to shift and morph as you look. And it was very hard to even choose what picture to use for a dome like this, because every angle that you take of it, it looks completely different. And then also certain uh, motifs and techniques were established in the Palazzo Barberini that then are taken up and elaborated and expanded in later Baroque buildings, right? So dramatic staircases, emphasizing motion uh, and activity. So this is the one in the Palazzo Barberini. Then this is in the later Würzburg residence, a Baroque palace of a bishop in Germany. And in these later Baroque buildings, they they pull out and expand the staircase. So it becomes a sort of grand display rather than being hidden in the corner of a building like you would often see in a medieval or classical building. Now it's being made a dramatic centerpiece and conveying this sense of upward motion, upward thrust. Similarly with fountains, right? Fountains become sort of showpieces of the Baroque. Uh, so this is one of the famous fountains in the gardens of Versailles. This is Apollo and his horse-drawn chariot emerging out of the water. So again, not a finished, uh, fixed, balanced piece, but rather an illusion of activity, of change, right? The, the horses seem to be emerging out of the water as you look at them. And then sort of the masterpiece of the Baroque fountain, Trevi Fountain, which uh, again, it, this is an Okeanos figure and all around is this sort of leaping, moving, almost writhing form of the rocks and the horses that seem to be kind of uh, emerging out of the bedrock and spewing forth this water. So there's constant motion activity uh, captured both in shapes in stone and also in literal movement of water. And there's trompe l'oeil. So trompe l'oeil, as you know, we saw it in the Renaissance, it's pushed to a new height in the Baroque. And maybe the most dramatic example here is in Sant'Ignazio in Rome, which is another church like Church of the Gesù. It was also built for the Jesuits, who were sort of the major sponsor and promoter of the Baroque, aside from kings and emperors. And they had uh, frescoes put in by Andrea Pozzo in the 1690s. This is the fake dome, right? So Pozzo wanted the building to have a dome, 
uh, but it wasn't feasible structurally or fiscally. So he made an illusory dome. <laughs> and from the right angle, it can really trick you. And he also painted this dramatic, huge trompe l'oeil fresco, The Triumph of St. Ignatius. So this is, it's hard to get a clear picture of it, but this is looking up into the ceiling of the nave. And you see Christ in the center, you see St. Ignatius closest to Christ, and then you see other saints and martyrs all around. And the illusion is so precise that it's hard to tell where the building ends and the painting begins. It seems as if the the top of the building is just exploding off and you're looking up into space and around it are these four sort of heavy elements, right? These four piers that are partly real, but then also spill over into the illusion of the painting. And each of these piers and the cluster of figures around it, each one represents a continent, right? So there's Africa, America, Asia, and Europe. So again, this effort to, to use four elements, just like at the Quattro Conti in, in Sicily, to use four elements to represent the corners of the globe being pulled together and unified together in one dramatic composition. And this, you could say, is sort of the crowning vision of the Baroque. And the Baroque also incorporated what we can call Neo-Solomonic motifs, sort of careful references to King Solomon and Solomon's temple, which is strategic because that was seen as kind of the, the biblical moment of unity of spiritual and temporal power. And this is what a lot of rulers in the 1600s wanted. They wanted to be absolute rulers with control over their temporal states and over religion and the church at once. So this became very useful to imagine, to, to sort of draw upon the idea of Solomon and the temple as the unity, right, of crown and church. And they took up certain motifs, some of them, it seems, borrowed from Jewish art, and some maybe the other way around, but like these twisted columns entwined with vines. These are meant to evoke the columns flanking the entranceway of Solomon's temple. So you see this motif on a Jewish ketubah or marriage contract from Italy, and then repeated in all kinds of Baroque buildings like this Jesuit church in Poland, and most dramatically in the baldacchino or uh, canopy right under the rotunda of St. Peter's designed by Bernini. And it makes sense that these Solomonic motifs were taken up because so many of the, the purveyors of the Baroque were rulers and emperors, right? Who wanted to imagine themselves as universal emperors. So the fashion in the 1600s was for rulers to build the grandest, most dignified Baroque palaces that they could. Uh, there are many of them. I won't get into all of them. <laughs> in to some degree, once you get what they are, you kind of, uh, once you've seen one, you've seen them all. So just this is the Mauritz House built by the House of Orange in the Netherlands. This is Peterhof built by Peter the Great of Russia outside St. Petersburg. This is Sans Souci built by Frederick the Great of Prussia. And finally, this is the Winter Palace of Catherine the Great of Russia. And you can see certain patterns, right? These broken facades with dramatic vertical elements and projecting elements. Each of these buildings can look almost like a city unto itself and the use of water, right, to reflect uh, and double the, the sort of grandeur of the building. And you can see certain regional styles and flavors of Baroque as it spreads and branches out, which can look quite different. So this is an example of Spanish Baroque, the facade that was added on to the Cathedral of Santiago de Compostela. And we saw this building before, it's a Romanesque cathedral, but in the 1600s, the crown paid to add on this highly ornate sort of wedding cake-like uh, Baroque facade. And in the interior of a Spanish Baroque church, you would see this kind of elaborate detail work. This is the altarpiece or so-called transparente of the Cathedral of Toledo, which was built to reflect and refract the light coming into the chancel 
from all directions. Again, sort of like St. Peter's, intentionally playing off the light to show change, motion, drama. And this is an example of French Baroque, Vaux le Vicomte. It's comparatively a little more understated, right? A little bit closer to Renaissance models, uh, more horizontal lines, uh, you know, rich ornamentation, but slightly more understated. And this reaches its most elaborate form, of course, in Versailles, which we've seen, you know, probably a million times. And the most famous chamber is this Hall of Mirrors, which again, like Vaux le Vicomte, it emphasizes these horizontal lines, breadth, reach, right? It's supposed to embrace the, the space around it, but now it's embellished with just unimaginably showy detail work, ornamentation, gold leaf covered statuary. It's sort of the ultimate height of Baroque extravagance. Dutch Baroque, right, embellishing these narrow uh, town homes, giving them elaborate <clears throat> ornamentation, these peaked vertical elements. And German Baroque, which is interesting because it's a funny sort of hybrid which ends up being very influential. So the exteriors of German Baroque buildings sometimes are a little bit more plain, a little bit more classical. This could almost be a late Renaissance building, the Karlskirche in Vienna. And then the inside is very sumptuous. It may not be quite as flashy as say the Hall of Mirrors in Versailles, but it has these delicate pastel colors, these sort of uh, naturalistic cloud-like forms. It almost is made to look sort of heavenly, um, but also living, almost organic. So this is a very distinctive form of the Baroque. And this Karlskirche in the interior, arguably it's showing already some influence of the Rococo, which is kind of the last variety or variation of Baroque from the continent. So the Rococo is this... Uh, form of, of late Baroque that began in France. It was originally French. And it's not only elaborate and ornate, but it strives for a sort of more organic, uh, soft, in some ways more feminine look, right? The, the Baroque was associated with the masculine, the male ruler. Uh, the Rococo was more associated with private realms. It shows up early on in bed chambers and salons, these sort of private closed spaces. It's associated often with women and femininity. And it uses these sort of elaborate, sinuous, curving and twisting lines like vine work or uh, like the human body. And it seems that the word Rococo comes from the French rocaille, meaning a rock grotto these sort of uh, decorated caves and caverns that people would find in their gardens or sometimes build artificially in their gardens to have the sort of a private, serene atmosphere of a natural grotto. And so it seems this ornamentation in the Rococo is sort of inspired by these grottos. And it starts off in these sort of city uh, palaces of rich families in France, but then it really spreads to Germany and takes off to a whole other level and becomes uh, a, a prominent German style. So this is the small salon in Schönbrunn Palace in Vienna, which was built for the Empress Maria Theresa. So it, again, is associated with a woman, in this case, a female ruler. And it's supposed to look kind of more domestic, more intimate, more organic. And then... Uh, this is one example of a Rococo monument, the Church of Fierzein Heiligen or the 14 Saints in Bavaria, which was a big pilgrimage gathering place. But uh, the sort of master of Baroque, Balthasar Neumann, rebuilt it in this kind of grand, splendorous Rococo style, right? With this uh, fresco showing kind of a country scene and then this delicate, almost fretwork-like border kind of like a cloud in the sky, these soft pastel colors, floral motifs. This was, you could say, kind of the Baroque pushing all the way to its limit, right? Trying to look almost like a, a natural form, a plant form, a flower opening up and coming to life before your eyes. So now the last 
country we should talk about here, this will be the last part, is England. And let me just check. Um, England was the most skeptical and resistant to the Baroque in the 1600s. So while the Baroque was really taking off in Spain and France and Germany, England sort of accepted it to some degree, but in a very resistant, skeptical kind of way. And early in the 1600s, there is a period of kind of whimsy and experimentation with the Jacobian style. This is an example of a banqueting house at a country estate in Gloucestershire. You can see this sort of whimsical decoration, these twisted uh, chimneys, almost like the Solomonic columns we saw. But then when the kings and queens of England decide to really build grand Baroque buildings, they do it in an extremely restrained and understated way compared to what was going on on the continent. And the, surf, the first sort of master English architect, celebrity architect of England, is Inigo Jones. And this is one of his masterpieces, the Banqueting Hall at Whitehall Palace, which you can see it has these Baroque elements, the gold work, the, the frescoes on the ceilings. But at the same time, it's very plain, symmetrical, airy, light right? The whitewashed walls, the simple colonnade, it's much more understated. And this becomes sort of the mark of English dignity and grandeur under the Stuarts. This is another building by Inigo Jones, the uh, Queen's House at Greenwich, which you might notice looks kind of similar to late Renaissance buildings we saw in Italy. Uh, this recessed porch, simple, uh, windows, plain entablatures, just a simple rectangle. And then this is the banqueting hall inside. And you can see, again, it has this sort of theatrical motif. It almost looks like a stage with a, a, an elevated gallery, but very plain, black and white, no frescoes. This was really, in a way, swinging in the other direction from the elaborate Baroque in France or Germany. After Inigo Jones died, the next English architect who sort of took his place as the architectural star of England was Christopher Wren, who was originally not an architect. He was an astronomer and a physician, and he was a professor of astronomy at Oxford. But when the university decided that they wanted a central grand meeting hall, they asked Christopher Wren to design it. And he put forward this design based on a Roman theater but the problem with the Roman theater is that it's open air. And in England, with the climate, you need a roof. So we had to come up with a complicated cantilevered uh, truss design to put a roof over this theater that would hold together and cover the space. And he came up with this sort of English, neo-Roman, neoclassical, Baroque concoction which uh, made a big splash and made him sort of the star in England. And two years after that, most of London burned down in the Great Fire of 1666. And there was all kinds of debate and uncertainty about how to rebuild the city and what it should look like after this fire. And a lot of people at this time, especially in England, were saying, we should look back to biblical precedents. We should try to build something that looks like the new Jerusalem. They wanted something grand, symmetrical, Solomonic. And many of them looked to Jewish art and Jewish mysticism as uh, a source and an inspiration. And one of them, John Evelyn, actually proposed rebuilding the streetscape of London to mimic the Kabbalistic tree of life. Uh, he believed that would bring good luck and good fortune. Uh, that didn't end up happening. It was legally and politically too difficult. But Christopher Wren was tapped to build new buildings for the rebuilding of London, especially churches that needed to be rebuilt. And he looked back to biblical and to Jewish models. And synagogues were an inspiration that Wren and other designers looked to for a sort of Protestant Baroque, right? Something that would be grand and thralling, but that would be more plain and restrained than the Catholic Baroque. And that 
would have a central design, a central focus. So these are just a couple examples of Jewish synagogues that are still standing, which I haven't mentioned before, but I'll mention them now. So this is the old new synagogue of Prague, built 1270, the oldest functioning synagogue in Europe. You can see it's a sort of plain Gothic style, right? Kind of high Gothic, but very plain and understated. And there's a Torah ark set into the back. So when worship is held, the Torah would be brought out of the ark and brought here into the central reading desk or tabah, where the lector would read out from the Torah and people would be sitting in the stalls around it. So it's a central inward facing building. And moreover, it's a building focused on the word, right? In the sense of hearing the scripture being spoken and expounded upon. So it was appealing as a model now for a Protestant church. And this is just another later example from the Renaissance, the Ashkenazi Synagogue of Venice. You can see the Renaissance style decoration, the faux marble paneling. And here again, you have a central reading desk, pews uh, looking inward, and then elevated above it in this sort of narrow space that the synagogue is squeezed into, you have an elevated women's gallery. So that was a common custom in the 14, 1500s in synagogues. You'd have the men on the ground floor, the women in the elevated gallery, and this grillwork screen separating the men and the women, right? Well, in the 1600s, the style changes. As in certain places like in Amsterdam, there's greater toleration for Jews. Many Jews gather there. They're allowed to obtain more land, build bigger, grander buildings. And so they build what have been called Solomonic style synagogues, much longer, sweeping, uh, more linear plans. And then these motifs like these twin, these huge twin pillars flanking the Taba are evocative of the pillars flanking the entranceway of Solomon's temple. And you have the elevated women's gallery, but it's now open, right? It's not uh, screened in, people can see over it, and the whole building is much more open, airy, uh, a feeling of, of grandness, of spaciousness. Well, this is the sort of thing that these designers in England, like Christopher Wren, draw upon. So this is the first church, large church, that Christopher Wren builds after the Great Fire. And you can see the profile of it is basically neoclassical, and it's very, it's very central in a really revolutionary way. So now instead of having a, a church facing back towards an altar, he's put the altar right in the middle of the rotunda. And the pews are arranged around it facing inwards. You have a sort of altar piece set in the back, but then this huge airy open rotunda above and this odd sort of canopy set into the corners that seems to mimic the elevated women's galleries in the synagogue. So this sort of put forward Wren's statement as a dramatic new, uh, fully realized English Baroque style, right? Something that had not been seen anywhere before and that was very much new and of the moment, but distinctively English and Protestant. So partly because of that, he then gets the commission to rebuild St. Paul's Cathedral, the biggest, most important building destroyed in the fire. And you can see, again, it's very Baroque, uh, the sort of broken facade, the colonnades, the huge towers. Um, but part of what's different about it is that he has everything done in this plain cream white marble so that it looks more serene, more understated, more bright, more airy. Right? And there's this balance then between the complexity of all these elements and the simple understated unity of the color scheme. So after St. Paul's Cathedral, you could say English Baroque kind of goes in two directions. There, in some places, it goes into more extreme lavishness and complexity. This is arguably the greatest extreme of ornate English Baroque, Blenheim Palace, which was built for the Duke and Duchess of Marlborough, the sort of main advisors and uh, unofficial uh, government ministers to Queen Anne. And this, this is the palace that is referred to briefly in the movie The Favorite right, where they, the Duke and Duchess are planning to build their extravagant palace. This is what it really looks like. Uh, 
all these complex kind of jumbled elements. Um, this palace is very controversial, just like the Duke and Duchess themselves are controversial. Some people see it as too much over the top, not right for England. Uh, it sort of smacks of continental Catholic extravagance. So people are really divided in how they view this kind of English Baroque. And even by the time Blenheim was built, this was already kind of out of style. It was a little behind the times because the country gentry by, by 1700 had turned back towards a kind of more restrained, more plain neoclassicism. So just as in the Tudor era, people integrated Renaissance elements into a sort of simple English country vernacular, likewise, by 1700, they were starting to do the same with this very restrained Baroque that almost is not Baroque anymore. It kind of looks almost like a throwback to the high Renaissance, uh, a plain neoclassicism, identical repeating stories, no unnecessary ornamentation, simple symmetry, uh, and horizontal lines. Right? So this becomes the look of the the country house that arguably can't even be called Baroque anymore. It's a kind of neoclassicism that's distinctive to the English countryside. And Palladio's books, so remember I, I, I said uh, Andrea Palladio produced these four books of architecture that laid out his sort of rules for how to make a dignified, harmonious house that uh, is in keeping with the land around it that speaks to the land around it. Well, these books start to be translated and reprinted in English, and they become kind of the manual for this new class of traveling country architects serving this rising English gentry and bourgeoisie, and that capture the sort of imagination of this new class who want to see themselves as a sort of dignified, refined, imperial ruling class on a par with the Romans. And they're attracted to this kind of simple, understated, kind of neo-Roman classicism. And this adaptation of Palladio to the English country house creates what's called the Palladian style. And there are a lot of elements still that you might still see today, like these rectangular windows with the little arch over the central element. We call this today a Palladian window, not because it was invented by Palladio, but because English architects knew of it and adopted it from Palladio. So it's one of these things we now think of as Palladian. And this may be the grandest example of a Palladian mansion in England, Holcomb Hall, which obviously looking at it, it's incredibly extravagant. It's a gigantic mansion on a gigantic plot of land. But nonetheless, at the same time, it was much more restrained and understated than, let's say, right, Blenheim Palace, right? So it sort of captures this new mood and this new interest in sort of serene, dignified country life and its understated taste and this sense that the home should really should not overwhelm the land. The land is the real centerpiece, the real uh, showpiece to be shown off. To the degree that a lot of architects start to focus not so much on buildings, which more and more were plain, understated, simply repeating familiar templates, and instead they shift to designing the land to look beautiful. And as one historian has pointed out, the Rococo style, which we talked about earlier, never really got very far in England, unless you say that this move to redesign land to create lakes and streams and bridges that emphasize the natural curving lines of the topography, this new creation of landscape architecture, this was sort of the equivalent of Rococo in England. This is where that new sensibility came in. And this is where arguably landscape architecture forms as a discipline and becomes, in a sense, kind of the national art form of England in this era. So lastly, before I go to the very end, I'll check. Um, yeah, great. Show even, let's see, start. 
Yeah. Awesome. Art history in general. Okay, good. I'm glad, I'm glad you're getting something from it. Um, so this is where you could say the reaction really happens. It's in the sort of country estates of this English country gentry where they want to present a kind of new face to the world, right? Something that seems dignified, that refers back to the dignity of the classical world, and that also celebrates and embraces the land. And Palladio's ideas take root so well in England, partly because England has always been very serious about its gardens, right? This is a wet climate, and people put a lot of work into creating beautiful uh, designed gardens that burst out in color during those few sunny days during the year, right? And lastly, I'll say, before uh, I close, the person who emerges as the great master and visionary of this new discipline of landscape architecture is Capability Brown. And this is one example of his work, the grounds of Chatsworth House, House in Derbyshire. And it may seem strange that this was all designed and landscaped because it looks naturalistic, right? This was part of the idea of this new movement was that uh, the, the land should look uh, lush, verdant, beautiful. There should be open, beautiful vistas and pathways, but it shouldn't look as if it's being controlled and designed like the formal gardens you'd see, say, at Versailles. And it may seem strange to end this architecture lecture on an image that has no buildings in it. But actually, if you look closely, you may notice there is the steeple of a church here. And this church actually is St. Peter's Edensor, which was built a bit later in the 1800s. And this church is an example of the Gothic revival style. So what happened and which, uh, what I'll talk about when, when I get to the last lecture, the next and final lecture, is how this classical revival movement in the countryside actually then led the way to a series of new styles that seek to create atmosphere, to evoke moods and historical references, uh, and that uh, harmonize with the environment and the land around them. So hopefully uh, next I'll talk lastly about romanticism and then about modernism. But thank you so much, everyone, for listening. And again, if you can help support and keep these lectures coming, go to my Patreon support at any level. Thank you.